Hello lovely people, welcome back to another video in the Distanzen series. The aim with this series is to talk to experts from different domains and see if we can get any ideas or inspirations that we can use to improve our online dance lessons. I'm very excited to share with you an interview I had with my good friend Greg Dyke who is uh, going to drop some serious knowledge about scaffolding and the zone of approximate learning and how we can use that to improve our online dance lessons. Here we go. Hi Greg, thanks for joining me on this channel. I'm really excited to have you here because uh, we've known each other for some years and I always uh, considered you as a very uh, reflective person when it comes to around teaching and the learning environment. But uh, from our conversations, I've actually learned that it's not just because you have passion for learning and thinking about uh, how to pre prepare the learning environment is actually part of your uh, research background. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, hi Ali, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I used to do research in um, a field called the learning sciences. And so the learning sciences is a field of research that looks at how um, learning contexts affect learning. And so it's really centering on learners are people who learn and you can design various situations in which people learn. Uh, so you can have teachers, you can have some kind of uh, educational game, uh, you can ask them to read books and learn. There's all sorts of ways that, that, that people learn and all sorts of strategies we can use uh, to improve that learning. Um, and so I specifically was involved in helping researchers who analyze uh, these learners in these learning contexts. And so I developed software that helped people do um, analysis. Um, and then there's uh, this kind of feedback loop where if you can figure out which things helped people learn when you analyze afterwards, you can then bring it in and try to analyze while people are doing stuff and say, oh, this thing they're doing here, this is really useful for learning. Or, hey, here they're not doing something that's not useful for learning. And then you can figure out various ways to adapt the context. So maybe you suggest the teacher, hey, you have three groups and that group is struggling. Or maybe you tell a group, hey, there's only one person who's talking in your group. Why don't you have multiple people talking? That was the, the kind of work that I was involved in, yeah. Right, so, so fascinating. Difficult, but also fascinating. We've been talking a little bit about this and there's one specific topic that uh, was very fascinating to me that I would love for you to share also here with our viewers and that is about the concept of scaffolding and how, why is it important, how do we do it and yeah, could you share a little bit about that that you shared with me before? Yeah, so there's this technical term that's called the ZPD or Zone of Proximal Development. And this stretches back 50 years or so, a researcher called Vygotsky, I believe. And uh, it's a very simple thing. It means there's things that we can do, there's things that we can't do, and there's things that we can do with the help of a teacher. And so the zone of proximal development is the space in which uh, that, that I can next uh, develop into. Uh, it's the things that, uh, as a teacher, I can help uh, a learner to, to do. And most of the activities that we do to get... Uh, as teachers to get a student into that zone of proximal development uh, is some form of uh, scaffolding. And so scaffolding is kind of a technical term for the things that we do. And there's a reason it's called scaffolding. If you think of a building, you put scaffolding around to improve it. And then once you've improved it, you take the scaffolding away. Uh, and that's one of the important things about scaffolding is that uh, it's temporary, it's contextual. Uh, and so that's one of the it's kind of, you can contrast that also to the instruction. Here's the information that I'm telling you, and here's the scaffolding that I'm putting out to help you learn that information or learn that skill. Yeah, that, that's so fascinating uh, to me, especially because if we're not aware of the, that it, it, something is supposed to be there as a scaffold and become like a permanent fixture of our teaching, how some things can go wrong from there. Can you can you share a little bit your thoughts around that? Oh, I have such a rant about that. Yeah, uh, like when I was, uh, I've learned a bunch of dances over the years. And when I was first learning salsa, like 15 years ago, 
the teacher would always count us in. And I could, I still cannot understand salsa music. I've taken a couple of mambo classes since then and gotten a little bit better, but I'm just so scared and terrified because I cannot find where that one is. Uh, and it's sort of indirectly related. One of the scaffolds we often use in dance classes is to count people in five, six, five, six, seven, eight. And it's really helpful for so many reasons. Like if you have a hundred students and they're all doing whatever, you don't really know what they're doing. If they're all counted in at the same time, you can scan around the room and immediately see, oh, 70 of them have got it. And that's really accessible information, really useful for teachers. And another reason you might do that, and it is a form of scaffolding that has multiple um, benefits, um, like it reduces cognitive load, so it reduces the amount of things that someone has to think of at the same time. So instead of stressing about where's the music, when do I come in, you count them in and they can think, okay, what was the first move of this choreography? Or what was the thing that they told us? Yes, relax my shoulders. And so you can, you can think about the one thing you're supposed to be thinking about. Um, and then, as you said, it's not necessarily supposed to be a permanent thing. And so many scaffolds, uh, that you use with less experienced students or just with students three, one, three weeks ago or three months ago or even one hour ago, you can progressively fade out so that they're not relying on, on them so much. Uh, that's, that's such an interesting approach or topic to think about while, while teaching. and Because um, I always saw this as hand-holding and... Um, and how, to what degree are we handholding our students through their learning? But the idea of scaffolding, you think of it as even broader than handholding, right? Like, could could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So, like handholding, we kind of think of as being. It sounds a little bit negative, right? Um, and maybe it's appropriate for beginners, like they, 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 we, we really need help, all the help we can get when we're a beginner at something. And so then it's appropriate to, to, to hold our hands. But someone who's more experienced, uh, although they're ready, to, although they might not know something yet, if the thing that you're doing to help them is thought of as, I'm holding your hand here, uh, they might be like, hey, I've been dancing for 15 years now. I don't really need you to hold my hand. I just need you to tell me what to do. Um, and it's also broader because uh, it serves different purposes. So we have like movement cues. Pretty much any movement class you teach, uh, you'll say something like uh, lengthen your lower back, uh, allow your rib cage to drop, uh, engage your core. Um, and those are cues that you would always give in uh, a class where you're not necessarily teaching that movement, but you're helping people achieve something else. Um, and then there's other things that we do that also count uh, as scaffolding. So like you're teaching someone some complex movement, you break it down into phases. And that's also a form of scaffold that you could also do in other ways. Like you could ask a student to, to watch some choreography and do the breaking down into phases uh, themselves. So scaffolds can exist uh, in ways that reduce cognitive load. So they reduce the number of things uh, that people are thinking about. They can exist in ways that provide metacognitive guidance. So that means telling students what they should be paying attention to right now. So, hey, we're doing a swing out. Look at the rhythms I'm doing with my whole body while I'm doing this swing out. Um, they can serve as sequencing and breaking down. Let's take this problem and break it down into uh, constituent steps. And any one of those scaffold, depending on what you're wanting students to teach, you might gradually remove over the course of an hour or over the course of a month or over the course of a year uh, because you expect students to become auton autonomous uh, with that material. Right. Let me go on to the last question. And uh, this is related to the purpose of this channel. And that is all about trying to bring the magic we have in our dance classes um, offline or in life and uh, trying to bring some of that magic into the online domain so that we can be more successful with our online experiences together with our students. And are there any thoughts you can share about how to apply and use the scaffolding concept on, in our online classes? Yeah, so the first thing is to, to all the, the teachers out here uh, who, who are listening, you guys, scaffolding is this technical word, but you're already doing scaffolding in your regular classes. And the reason that thinking about scaffolding is useful is because then you can kind of think this thing that I just do naturally or on purpose as part of my teaching, 
what is the purpose that it serves? Can I do exactly the same thing and translate it over into an online class? Or maybe there's an opportunity to do something even better. Or maybe there's something that doesn't translate. Uh, so a couple of examples of that. Um, for one, uh, scaffolding can be thought of in two styles. One someone has called hard scaffolds and some people called soft, soft scaffolds. A hard scaffold that has some kind of uh, material um, um, embodiment. Uh, so for example, a whiteboard with some instructions on is a hard scaffold or a worksheet. And soft scaffolds are those that we can uh, improvise. So they'll often be verbal or maybe nonverbal in some other way. Um, soft scaffolding is kind of where I think of my strength as a dance teacher, and I think a lot of dance teachers are kind of like that. We look at the room, we see how people are doing, and boom, we adapt um, to provide the scaffolding that students need at that moment. And that's something that's really kind of lost um, when you go online in a couple of ways. It's much more difficult to observe students during live online classes, like particularly their rhythms. They're going to be out of sync. You can't see them so well. Um, and in offline uh, classes, because you can't observe uh, at all, uh, it's difficult to, 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 to do that improvisation. But a whole bunch of the things that we have in mind when we're doing that improvisation can be translated into some kind of material scaffold. So, for example, typically with videos, you can do so much with annotating your videos or perhaps even providing two, two soundtracks to your videos. So like one thing we often do in a dance class is demonstrate, here's version A, here's version B. And sometimes there's a suggestion that maybe version A is not so good and maybe version B is the good version, or maybe version A is the one we would like you to do and version B is the one we would like you to not do, whatever the one is. It's super difficult when you're a student watching this thing to remember, oh, am I watching version A? Am I watching version B? And suddenly live classes, yeah, I'm not quite sure. You could probably do something a little bit better with a whiteboard or maybe some, because it's a lot more visible. You have a lot more screen estate uh, to actually show words or something. And then if you have video, you can actually add a label. This is version A, this is version B. Uh, and that's something that you couldn't have done at all in a live situation. So you have this new opportunity taking something that's this soft improvised scaffold uh, and changing into a hard scaffold that um, has different qualities, but gets across the thing that you that you want to get across yeah that's uh, that's a great idea especially uh, the thought of like you have so much you have a different real estate here and the students have front row uh, seats to 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 view you as well they don't need to fight around uh, like uh, trying to be blocked by other people so you could actually use that real estate on your screen a little bit better uh, whether you put a sign on the side or like you say edit uh, edit it um uh, post if it's not live for example that's uh that's a very fascinating idea i think uh, i would love to explore around uh around that a lot more in fact uh in the in the spirit of this channel this is a recommendation for anybody who is watching this if 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 this conversation inspires some thoughts and ideas uh, for you please put it in the chat uh, let's let's uh, develop some conversations around these topics so we can help each other create better online experiences for our students. Actually, while we're here, can I squeeze out one more idea out of you? Is there anything else you would like to share with us? Yeah, so one thing I'm really excited about is um, when we go into asynchronous learning, so things that are not live classes but are happening online, so lots of people have these online dance schools where you have a bunch of pre-recorded videos. Um, and obviously the first thing you do is you make your video kind of like you would a class, but you make it your perfect class. Uh, what you can do is maybe think of it in a different way, is that students can actually engage with those videos. Uh, they can pause them, they can rewind them, they can make them go slowly. They can switch between one video where maybe you're saying uh, the rhythm with counts and another video where maybe you're saying the video the rhythm um, with movement names and maybe a third video where you're just dancing to the music. Uh, and so they don't have to have this linear journey through your material. And so there's kind of two things you could do. One is just take your video and give some verbal instruction. So this would also be a form of scaffold uh, of how students could engage with the video. If you're a beginner, look at part A 
and um, just try to do part A, learn part A with us. Uh, if you're an advanced student, part A you should be able to watch once and then just do it with us. So I want you to try that. And then only when you've tried it, you go back again and you look at the parts that you missed. And so that's ways that you can kind of um, guide students, what it's called uh, metacognition. So their ability to think about how they're learning and how they're engaging with material and allow them to pick uh, the, the, the metacognitive strategy, so just the, the path through the material uh, that works for you. And then you can get kind of a lot more techno technological if that's your thing, you don't have to, but you could do that thing where you have a video and then you record multiple audios over it uh, or add a bunch of labels. So this is part A and so you have part A on the screen going through the whole part A to help students know this is still part A or this is phrase one, this is phrase two, this is phrase three. Um, you can provide a bunch of information that helps students pick through the video and then you can provide some learning strategy guidance of how you, different paths that students could take through the video so that it's not just one linear thing but multiple non-linear journeys that students can tailor to what they need to get out uh, of class. Fantastic. And what will be our less tech-savvy version of the same idea? So to say, because that, that I think um, that approach will need uh, quite a bit of knowledge of how to how to work around the technology aspect of that. Yeah, and it's it's very difficult this online learning thing because everyone who's excited about technology is so freaking excited about technology. Uh, but I know a lot of dance teachers. One of the reasons they're dance teachers is that they have no interest in technology whatsoever, uh, and that's the, the 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 great thing also. Uh, is that the learners are kind of the same. They don't need you to have a flashy website with bells and whistles and everything. Um, but what you can do is just take the video that you recorded, and that video doesn't have to be perfect. I know it's good for marketing for that video to be quite good, but it really doesn't have to be perfect for learners to get a lot out of it because they're the ones that are doing the learning. And so then you can take your imperfect video uh, and you can just write a few lines of text about how students can engage with that video. And it doesn't even have to be a lot. It can be like three lines of text saying, try this, try this, try this. And that gives already three different ways of engaging with that material. And then you combine it with the fact that students can press pause, they can press play, they can slow it down, they can speed it up. Uh, and then suddenly students have this infinite way, paths, infinite number of paths that they can engage with this one video that you did. And that's super powerful because everyone learns slightly differently. Everyone needs slightly different things. Today, what I need is different from what I need tomorrow. Uh, and so it, it um, I'm thinking about this also in terms of, of research. Um, a lot of people who do research that are in the same bind. Uh, some of them are really interested in technology. It can be disruptive. It can be really intricate. It can do amazing things with machine learning and so on. But some of the best results that researchers have gotten has been just here is a worksheet with three things reminding the students. Uh, I want you to give good explanations. Whenever you make a statement, I want you to give uh, the reasoning behind that statement. And that's those two points. And they just put it up in the corner of a forum uh, and ask student, so as to remind students every time that they're participating in this forum or participating in this chat or whatever, those are the two things you have to remember. And that is super powerful and super changing with really, really simple technology. Fascinating. Well, for me, I'm getting a lot of different ideas that I would love to try for our <laughs> online platform. And uh, I mean, that's the, again, that's the whole spirit of this channel, getting ideas to try um, to see what works uh, in terms of bringing some of the dance magic online. Before we, if we take this as a um, wrapping up moment, is there anything you would like to plug in here? Any Anything you want to share or something for viewers to know how to engage with you in the future? Uh, yeah, so I have a, a podcast called Walk to Work. It's been uh, dormant for the past year because, uh, you know, uh, COVID and I kind of didn't run out of things to say, but I ran out of desire to to, to to say them right now because there were more important things going on. But in there, I, I, I talk quite a bit about various uh, teaching things. Um, I've gotten to try both online and offline and how that's worked out for us. 
uh, and also talk a bit more about some of the, the learning theory ideas that they're not new information to teachers because the way that we get learning theory ideas is to look at how great teachers teach and um, say, what can we learn from this? What, what did they do? Uh, and so that's, it's just kind of giving words to what you do and saying, oh, if that's the thing I'm trying to do, I can achieve the same result in this slightly different way. Uh, so yeah, definitely uh, you can um, hit me up uh, via the uh, podcast uh, or uh, via my blog uh, or via Facebook. Uh, you can find my blog, uh, gregdyke.github.io. Uh, um, and one thing also I can do is uh, provide um, guidance or feedback if you're looking for that kind of thing or put you in touch with um, a lot of my former colleagues uh, like world, export, world, world experts in this field. And there's so much no, more research coming out because of COVID. There's lots of research into online learning. Uh, it's really difficult to dig through all that stuff, uh, but definitely either me or I can put you in touch with people uh, who, who uh, can help you out with whatever the problem is or whatever the questions are you have. This is awesome. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to have you on this channel. Thanks, Ali. This is a super exciting project you have, and I'm really glad to have been part of it.